Sana'a inaugurated the seventh year of resisting the Saudi war with a large air operation targeting several Aramco oil facilities simultaneously. A development that predicts that the precious Saudi black gold will be at the top of the list of targets of the Yemeni armed forces this year until the siege on Yemen is broken and the war comes to an end. The anniversary of the Saudi Emirati aggression against Yemen has turned into a national day celebrated by the Yemeni people, not to commemorate the war that worsened the humanitarian situation for the majority of the people of this country, but to honor the sacrifices made by these people on various fronts. Sana'a, which was the first stop for the Saudi warplanes bombing on the morning of March 26, 2015, is today in a highly advanced military, political, security and economic position and has become, in the eyes of the Yemenis and whoever supports them, a symbol of resistance and steadfastness. Despite its exposure to tens of thousands of airstrikes during the past years and the decision by the government of Abdrabbo Mansour Hadi to transfer the capital to the city of Aden in the middle of the first year of the war, Sana'a remains the center of political, military and economic decision making by resisting aggression and facing the siege. It has achieved over the past six years successes on various fronts of confrontation to become a very strong counterpart for Riyadh. Last Friday, on the very early hours of the sixth anniversary of the Saudi war, the Yemeni missile force and the bomber drones unit carried out a large offensive operation against military and economic targets in the depths of Saudi Arabia. The retaliatory attack dubbed Operation National Day of Resilience was carried out by 18 drones and 8 ballistic missiles. It targeted the headquarters of the Aramco oil facility in Yanboa, Jizan and Ras Tanura, as well as the King Abdulaziz base in Dammam. Other targets were the military sites in the Najran and Asir areas, which were hit with 6 Qasif 2K drones. These messages were accompanied by great popular support expressed in the major marches that took place during the same day in Sana'a and other governorates under the control of the Salvation Government. Tens of thousands of Yemenis from the square of Sana'a airport, which has been closed for more than five years by the Saudi Emirati coalition, announced their support for proceeding in the defensive battle until the foreign occupation was removed and its militias were defeated. Welcome to the Middle East stream, Ammar Wausman. Welcome to episode 100 of the Midi Stream. 12 domestically manufactured Samad 3 combat drones, in addition to 8 ballistic missiles of Zulfiqar, Badr, and Sa'ar types, struck targets in the Saudi cities of Rasta Noura, Rabir, Yanboa, as well as Jizan, home to key Saudi Aramco oil installations, as part of a large scale operation, National Day of Resistance. The Yemeni armed forces also launched six Qasif 2K bomber drones against military sites in historic Yemeni, Najran, and Asir regions. Such a busy weekend for Mohammed bin Salman indeed. Now to discuss this issue with us from Belgrade is Joaquin Flores, editor at Fort Ruiz News website. Thank you for being with us, Joaquin. Now we have been revisited by the Yemeni uh, Armed Forces spokesperson General Yahya Saria several times for the past couple of weeks with news of targeting Saudi Arabia's Achilles heel in Ras Tanura port, which exports about more than 80% of uh, all Saudi oil to uh, um, uh, foreign countries uh, by targeting Aramco oil facilities also inside the capital uh, Riyadh uh, to other military, military sites in Dammam and Khamis and Shait added to that uh, Jizan and Najran. Will it take longer than that till this actually brings Saudi Arabia to negotiations table and to lift the blockade and stop this unnecessary war? The uh, Saudi initiative at this time, this war upon Yemeni people, uh, is a long-term plan that they have oriented themselves and really have put all of their uh, resources behind. This is their a very big gambit and push. And so while, as, as your audience will appreciate, Aramco is Saudi Arabia's state-owned firm. They are the largest uh, concern of its type in, in uh, the region. 
uh, they um, certainly are prepared to take losses. And while this is an important uh, thing to strike and is also important because it is uh, a legitimate military target, uh, being such an economic one, uh, at the same time, um, my view is that the Saudis are willing to take these types of hit against its uh, oil export concerns, these facilities. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, the thinking behind their adventure uh, in Yemen uh, to oppress and to, and to steal uh, Yemeni's resources is precisely to diversify away from being primarily uh, a crude oil uh, producing country. Mm -hmm. Yemen is very wealthy in terms of its natural resources, its gold, its copper, and natural gas. So this is the direction that things are going in terms of Saudi Arabia's attempts, uh, which I believe will be futile, to diversify its economy, to further develop its electronics and computer uh, production, microchips and so forth, uh, and the, the like. Now, uh, what will bring Saudi Arabia uh, to the table will be the fact that they have not been able to see a return on this investment in war. Uh, they are bleeding their resources. They had built up an army, uh, primarily with some intention at some point of being part of a joint occupational force in Saudi Arabia uh, to go into Syria and into Iraq. Those plans failed, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And what to do with this army? Well, uh, Yemen is a good target and allows them to fulfill some long-term economic goals, but uh, time is not on their side. They are running out of time, and I believe time will be what uh, does it in for Saudi Arabia. Um, while these attacks on Aramco's facilities are important, they are more symbolic, and they send a lot of the investors on the Saudi side into this conflict uh, into disarray well, and it, uh, it discourages them and it reduces what their confidence it, in the Saudi this plan. This is what makes, makes it interesting here, Hakim, because uh, the leader of the uh, Yemeni armed forces, uh, the leader of Ansarullah himself, said Abdul Malik al-Houthi, he said last week, while commemorating the uh, sixth year of the war against Yemen, that uh, he is ready for, quote, honorable peace, unquote with uh, Saudi Arabia, but the kingdom has to hold its attacks and lift the blockade of the uh, Yemeni sea and aerial, uh, 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 of the Yemeni sea and air. Uh, that was his response to a plan which was announced a week earlier by the Saudi Arabian uh, foreign ministry. Now, the response came in the form of drones and in the form of missiles. Why not just accept the Saudi initiative and start from there? You know, uh, Saudi Arabia has been playing fast and loose with the definition of the word peace. Uh, um, what uh, Al Tusi Al Houthi talks about with an honorable peace is actually just a peace that two sides could agree to. What Saudi Arabia has proposed is, in fact, uh, a surrender on the part of Yemen sovereign forces, and this is, of course, unacceptable. And also, I would include that uh, the Ansar Allah leader, uh, Al Houthi, his, his insistence that attacks end as a precursor to a final peace is nothing more than saying we would like a ceasefire as we prepare to sit down at the final negotiating table. This is a very normal thing. This is what all countries uh, engaged in hostilities as they plan to end those hostilities. This is what they do. Uh, so suggestions that we see in some uh, really despicable Saudi media that these demands <laughs> uh, are somehow abstract or unreasonable is purely propaganda. And it's, it's come to be expected from Saudi sources in, in media. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, well, um, but, uh, to respond we also to saw, such, yes, we saw something that, that was very, very important that we never see in the mainstream media, whether it be it in the Arab mainstream media or the Western one, where tens of thousands of Yemenis rallied across Yemen on Friday to commemorate uh, uh, the uh, war against their country and to show of support for the popular Ansarullah and the Yemeni armed uh, forces in the face of the devastating Saudi-led military campaign. Now, with the blockade, bombing uh, campaigns, with the poverty, with the pandemic, with the uh, 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 starvation, what keeps tens of thousands of people steadfast and sticking to their political opinion through thick and thin? 
Well, unlike what we see in some Western coverage of, of this conflict, this is not a proxy conflict between two regional hegemons. Rather, this is an effort by Saudi Arabia to take over Yemen, to actually expand its territorial to that Yemen, as far as a functioning uh, state would cease to exist, and it would just be an adjunct or, or appendage of Saudi Arabia. The majority of you, many people know this, they're aware of this. They, 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 they are not lost on this you know, fact, and, uh, and they are aware of what the consequences would be of a final uh, Saudi victory, which is, first of all, not militarily possible because mm -hmm. uh, Yemen's allies in the world have not even directly acted yet, whereas we have seen this is overtly uh, Saudi Arabia acting uh, as its own military power after a number of failed gambits to have several Al-Qaeda-type proxies accomplish the same previously, which failed. And now you have Saudi Arabia directly acting in this conflict, and they are not gaining significant well, from, ground. From what you just mentioned, Joaquin, and from the advancement of the Yemeni armed forces to Ma'rib, which is a very oil-rich uh, part yes. of uh, Yemen, um, what does Mohammed bin Salman still have uh, in his possession to at least bring it along in any future talks with Yemen? All of these will, will boil down to um, the business end of things, and they will actually say, this is where Canada can fit in. You know, Canada has had a concern for the past dozen years uh, with the mineral exports. So there are a number of Western countries um, which uh, are all in with the Saudi effort because the Saudis have promised that they will be able to maintain supply line security. As we have said, Yemen is wealthy in gold and silver and copper, and they have the largest uh, arable land and fertile soil. And we saw with the Arab Spring and how food prices were manipulated as the U.S. cornered the market in that following the 2008 bank bailouts. Countries learned they need access to grain. Yemen can possibly even produce more than they already produce as some, one of the region's largest producers uh, in this area of grain, mm -hmm. of, of food. So Yemen is very valuable. These are all things that Yemen can say, we are a sovereign state. We can make reasonable negotiations. We can export things that other countries want and need, but you're not going to steal it from us. But I think that keeping a non-ideological approach and being open-minded about the realities of global trade, that a sovereign a Yemeni state uh, after this conflict will be able to engage in normal trade. Well, I want to thank you very much, Joaquin Flores, analyst and uh, a part of the uh, For Truth News website editor there. I want to thank you very much for being with us. Now, please stay tuned because next we will be talking about the politics behind the Suez Canal blockade. Since it was completed in 1869, the Suez Canal has been one of the world's most important bodies of water, a portal between East and West that has been controlled by multiple countries, threatened to ignite war and become a bedrock of the global economy. But the mammoth container ship that had lodged itself last week through the waterway possessed a very modern problem. About a tenth of global trade passes through the Suez Canal and made way for an Israeli plan to find its own alternative for the region. Politics behind the Suez Canal blockage in this following report. When the evergreen container ship ran aground in the Suez Canal on Tuesday, March 23rd, its bulk blocking shipping traffic through the key global thoroughfare, the world looked on, wondering how the authorities would manage to unstick the behemoth. Almost a week later, on Monday, March 29, the vessel was reportedly partially freed from the banks of the Suez Canal, raising hopes the vital waterway could reopen and ease global shipping backlogs. Already, shipping analysts estimated the traffic jam was held up nearly $10 billion in trade each day. So as a salvage team and canal authorities continued their battle to dislodge the four football field long ship, global supply chains were another day closer to a full-blown crisis. 
This unfortunate closure of the Suez Canal has simultaneously brought back to debate, spoiler alert, Israeli plans competing with the Egyptian Suez. The Suez Canal has kept its strategic importance for global trade since 1869. However, recently Israel has started attempts to diminish the canal's importance by constructing a so-called peace train. The railroad project that was presented to public in 2018 plans to connect the Israeli port Haifa with Dubai. It is thus a counterpiece in Trump's Abraham Accords and the Israeli-Arab normalization. Despite the grave cost, Israelis seem to forget about securing real peace and security first. Securing such a railroad might just prove to be costlier than actually profiting from it. This is not the end of it. According to a U.S. 1963 memorandum, which was declassified in 1996, Israel has been planning all along to dig its own canal from Eilat to Ashkelon. Despite the fact that this would be very complicated, very difficult, and very, very expensive, Israel and the U.S. still had plans for this project, which would have been implemented by blasting an alternative Suez Canal through Israel using 520 nuclear bombs. Yes, you heard that right. 520 nuclear bombs in the occupied Palestinian Naqab Desert. The memo added that such a canal would be a strategically valuable alternative to the present Suez Canal and would probably contribute greatly to economic development. Stealing and occupying Arab land is not enough now for the Israeli entity. It seems also stealing Egypt's most valuable source of revenue is on their list too. Again. Now to discuss this issue with us from Beirut is Dr. Jamal Wakim, academic and political analyst. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Wakim. Now, the importance of the uh, Suez Canal stems first and foremost from its location. It is the only place that directly connects the water for between Europe and the Arabian uh, Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the countries of the Asia Pacific. So without the Suez Canal, shipments traveling through parts of the world, parts of the world could take at least three weeks if they have to go uh, through the continent of Africa. But this adds a lot of hefty cost and substantial uh, uh, maybe payments for the journey if they don't have to go through the Swiss Canal, which is why this ship needs to be freed. Why is Egypt being left alone to deal with this issue? And now, while we're filming this, this is on Monday, our show will be aired on Tuesday, it is being said that the ship is lodged again, it's locked again because of the heavy wind. Well, uh, the issue is not technical in this sense. First, uh, uh, back to, uh, uh, let's say, ancient history, Egypt has always played the role of the link between the trade of the East Mediterranean and Indian Ocean via the Red Sea. And uh, this had made it not only uh, one of the cradles of civilization alongside Mesopotamia, but also a competitor to Mesopotamia, which enjoyed an, an alternative line of communication. So history and the international system were born in the Near East based on these uh, trade routes that would uh, uh, crisscross uh, this region. So uh, in modern times, the digging of the, uh, and actually the, it was the ancient pharaohs who were the first to dig a canal that links uh, the Red Sea to the Nile and then to the uh, East Mediterranean. In the modern times, the digging of the canal has uh, 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 not rendered uh, 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 actually uh, an importance to uh, Egypt, a geopolitical importance, but rather it benefited from the uh, location of Egypt on the crossroad and on the intersection of international trade routes to boost this role. And of course, much of the uh, geopolitical identity and the motives, directions, and drives of Egypt are determined by uh, geopolitical uh, aspirations, including the digging of the canal. And it was the digging of the canal that led Egypt to be uh, to get occupied by the British. Mm -hmm almost uh, a decade uh, later. So the, the uh, canal was uh, dug in 1869. It was uh, terminated. Uh, in 1882, uh, Egypt was under occupation. It had to struggle for seven decades until it 
uh, won its uh, independ full independence under Nasser, and then it had to wage a war of independence uh, when, uh, after nationalizing uh, the canal in 1956, the British, uh, French, and Israelis launched a war against uh, uh, Egypt. Egypt. And uh, back in, uh, uh, then in 1967, another war uh, was determined by the dynamics of this geopolitical importance of Egypt on one hand, mm -hmm. and trying to marginalize it by uh, all means, because Egypt is considered as the biggest Arab country, and it's the basis uh, uh, for either uh, controlling uh, the the Arab countries if a foreign power controls it the way the United States did, for example, mm -hmm. uh, after uh, the death of Nasser under Sadat onward, or it could be also the bastion uh, of national liberation, not only in Egypt but also in the Arab world, the Muslim world. And Africa, Which and that's is, why this gets me uh, to a very important point, Doctor uh, Wakim. I'm sorry I have to cut you in, but it's mm -hmm. a very limited time that we have. Mm -hmm. This uh, adding to the importance of the uh, Suez Canal, which you presented right now, which is a security mm -hmm. and geopolitical importance. Mm -hmm. uh, Israel now decides to make its own uh, Suez Canal by uh, uh, first of all, before speaking about uh, how it, it wants to mm -hmm. do it, the cost effect of a process of actually having an alternative canal mm -hmm. is 55 billion. US dollars, but yeah. apparently the canal would pay for itself in 10 years of operation. How mm. capable do you think such a project would be and how would that affect mm. Egypt? Well, first, uh, the issue is addressed by the Israelis not in terms of economic efficiency, but in terms of geopolitical dominance and hegemony. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if the canal would cost five trillion dollars, they would seek to dig it, the alternative canal, because as part of controlling Egypt is to control and jeopardize its water resources. Uh, and since the days of Ben-Gurion, for example, there were talks about diverting and controlling the uh, water resources of Egypt, also of Syria and uh, uh, Iraq with digging uh, uh, or uh, with, uh, with building dams uh, that would, uh, would control uh, the flow of water in the Tigris and Euphrates uh, in Iraq and Syria mm -hmm. based on a dam that would be built in Turkey and back then uh, and of course a dam in Ethiopia. Back then uh, these talks were uh, taken lightly uh, too bad by the successors of Nasser. Mm -hmm. Nasser took them seriously, by the way. But then, after his death, Sadat took uh, them lightly and considered that his good relations with the Americans would uh, ward off uh, all these threats. However, the Israelis and the Americans were persistent in pursuing these uh, geopolitical goals. They were the ones to support Turkey in building the dam of Ataturk, and they were also the ones to support another uh, dam in uh, Ethiopia. Well, another this, this plan, brings us, that brings another us to the plan. project. This brings us to the project of yeah. the U.S. that was the U.S. planning since the 1960s by using Definitely. 520 yeah. nuclear bombs. The, yeah. uh, this, is, this was a classified memorandum by the U.S. It was declassified in 1996. That Definitely. was just in time, by the way, when the Mona nuclear reactor was installed inside of the Naqab Desert as well. How do you assess such an unfathomable uh, thought of 520 nukes to open a waterway in the desert in occupied Palestine? Definitely, because I was talking about ways to control Egypt and put it under chain uh, through controlling the water resources, the Nahda Dam, but also through stripping it from its control of the international, the most important international uh, uh, waterway, waterway uh, which is the Suez Canal. And this plan was first uh, forged by uh, Ben Gurion, the founder of the uh, Israeli entity mm -hmm. in 1949, as a mean not only to uh, control the international trade routes and the, uh, um, the link between the East Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. Uh, one way was to destroy, for example, the uh, port of Beirut and replace it with the port of Haifa and normalize relations with uh, UAE, but also 
by controlling this waterway or having a waterway of its own. But there is also another dimension for this, which is to earn or to give the Israeli entity natural borders because the canal would separate uh, uh, occupied Palestine mm -hmm. from Sinai on one hand and also by a branch that would uh, nurture the Dead Sea, it would also separate occupied Palestine from Jordan naturally and this would uh, give the Israelis uh, 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 borders that are much easier Official to defend. Official borders, just yes. to remind our audience that un until now is the Israeli entity is mainly the only uh, entity on the, on the, in the world that has no borders yet yeah. because of its occupation. Well, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Jamal Wakim, academic and political analyst, for joining us to talk about this very important issue that might be the reason for any upcoming next war in the Middle East. I'll be happy to have you on again and talk more about it. Thank, thank you for being with us and thank you for watching Please stay tuned next week for more from the Mideast stream.